screaming at the top of my lungs, I hate this. I hate this feeling. I want this to go away. Why can't I stop? Why can't I stop? That's how bad I had gotten on meth. Hello everybody, my name is Pej. Today I'm going to talk to you about methamphetamines, the devil's dandruff. Uh, that's not a saying that I actually came up with myself. It's something that I've heard over the years. And I think that it's very pertinent and it definitely holds its own name for that purpose and that reason. Because meth definitely um, deteriorates your soul. And if you're using methamphetamines, however you're using it, for whatever purpose you're using it it, it, it takes a toll on you over a period of time. So let me describe to you my experience with, with meth, um, with amphetamines, and what exactly I've seen and also what I've learned about it. So <clears throat> early on, I remember when I was um, a lot younger, I was doing, I was experimenting with different types of drugs, but there was a time when I was smoking a lot of pot and gaining a lot of weight. And in doing, you know, doing that, I had learned about this uh, drug that was going around. They would call it crank or crystal meth. And that was more like around the late 80s, early 90s. And a lot of people were, women were doing it because they could lose weight very fast. And, and when I caught wind of it, I, I obviously wanted to lose some weight, but I also, I liked stimulants. I liked to be stimulized. And um, I remember that once I, I had, I had experimented with cocaine before, and you know, cocaine is very euphoric. But um, once I tried meth, actually the first time I ever tried it, I didn't like it. Uh, cocaine was more for me at that time. So I went back to doing coke for a while. But something happened where I, I realized like, you know, a lot of my friends were getting into methamphetamines. And like I said, back then it was called crank, crystal meth. Um, it only came in uh, different types of forms. There was this stuff called um, the pink meth at the time. There was lemon drop and then there was some off some kind of, it was, God, what was the other one called? I forget the name of it, but regardless. So the other, there was three different kinds that we would get. And the reason they called it crank was because there was a lot of biker gangs uh, that were sort of distributing the meth uh, in and around California. And they would hide it in the crank shaft of their motorcycles. So it gained the name crank. And so, like I said, I got my hands on some and I just remember the very first time that I really tried it, I didn't like it, but down the line when I got back into it, uh, we would snort it. And when you snorted meth, it, it sort of just, it felt like somebody shoved a pencil all the way up into your nose and it was an excruciatingly painful experience in that moment. And you had to wait until your brain would register. Once it got in there and, the, and it would, automatically heal within about a minute where you hadn't didn't have that pain anymore that was when you have that euphoric high where you're just like taking off and we called it everything from jet fuel back then to rocket fuel to it was you know so you would take off and it seemed like everything would just silence in the world all of the thoughts and all of the different things that you feel and see and hear it was if you've ever seen the movie limitless it was like in that moment of, of pure blissful euphoria and it's captivating in a sense like the feeling of that in that moment is something that you you experience and you keep chasing. So me personally, I feel like once I felt that, I chased that same feeling for a long time. And although over the years I tried different types of meth and, and I got different feelings from it, I never really felt like I got the feeling I did from that first high. So there was, you know, at that, and then also the downfall to it is that once you do it, it's not like cocaine where you do it and you feel it for about 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, you, you do meth and you can stay up for a long time, for hours on end, days on end. And you, you forget about a lot of things. You forget to eat. You forget to, obviously you, you're not tired. You're not sleepy. So you can go days and days and days. And the problem is, is that um, you know, on a spiritual level, you sort of become demonic because when you don't, you know, from lack of sleep, from from uh, your body deteriorating, from being malnourished, all the different things that happen to you, you're obviously not functioning like a regular human being. So you depend on more to keep you going or you just keep on going and going and going and going until you crash and burn. And, um, and then once you crash and burn, you're down for sometimes, you know, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, depending on how long it takes for your body to rejuvenate. And then once you get up, um, you, you're looking for it again. Now, there's a lot of times when you will experience anxiety and depression. Um, I myself wasn't really a Xanax user. As a matter of fact, I was never a Xanax user, but a lot of people would use things to 
to take the edge off because obviously it makes you very edgy. It makes you agitated, angry, it makes you moody, it makes you uh, combative, it makes you destructive, you know, obviously you're self-destructing within yourself and then you start picking at your face and or you'll uh, start projects around the house that are never, they're always unfinished projects. Um, and that goes with, you know, your brain is always on overdrive. So you want to construct and build and do things and, and get things accomplished. And truth be told, you know, I, I didn't even need to hire a maid because I could just make the house look immaculate within a couple of hours. I would go the ex I would overkill. I mean, I would go the extra. I'd get down in between tiles with a toothbrush and, and rubbing alcohol. To, and it just had this effect on you to where you, you always wanted to to expand and do more and, and accomplish more and get more done. And you know, another experience that I had with more medical meth was that a, a friend of mine was going to college. He had been prescribed, and this is obviously something that we've known for many years and decades, is that a lot of college kids um, that go to, to school, they get prescribed meth by a doctor, not meth, well, I'll call it Ritalin, which to me it's, it's medical meth. And it's, it's basically Ritalin, Vyvanse, um, Adderall, these, these are, they're medical speed. So they will make you, there's, they're made to have you concentrate and focus more in class, but people also abuse those too. Um, I remember for a while back in the day when we couldn't get meth for like a couple of days, well, my, we took my friend's Ritalin and we snorted it. And you know, that's just what we did. Um, my other experiences with, with meth over the years was that uh, I would think that I'm not so bad. Uh, like I, there was a time I remember in my mid twenties where I realized like I am getting so bad and I was really starting to feel sorry for myself, be down on myself. I felt like the world was against me. I would have a lot of depressive bouts, so I would quit. And so when I quit, I remember uh, I went about four or five years without meth. We called ourselves, I called the people that did it tweakers and I didn't want to be a tweaker, right? So. Um, and obviously they, there's a reason it's called a tweaker because you're always tweaked out or tweaking things or, you know, but I remember about four or five years after not allowing anybody that does that in my life, I got into a relationship with a girl who was newly getting into meth. And at that time it had totally changed from being snortable meth to, uh, they called it glass and glass and ice were, they were a meth that had been washed with acetone and there was a certain, it, f formulatically, I don't even know if that's a word, and you know, they would make a certain formula out of it to where it would, it would come out in shards. So before it was like chunks, but the shards looked like little glass pieces. And then when you took those, you could, you could snort them, but it's really gonna hurt your nostrils. But it was actually made that way for people to be able to smoke it. And when people would smoke it, again, now what, what I saw, the and I started getting into it because I saw that she was in it. I remember it was like a three-way road. I remember thinking, I used to have a problem with this stuff. It's different now, but it's still the same. And I was you know, experimenting a little bit with her because obviously, don't you know, I have to let her know that I used to do this too. So I remember thinking about the three-way road and thinking, Either I'm gonna quit this stuff now, which I really should because I know what's, what's gonna happen. I mean, it becomes, I become a demon on it, right? Or I'm going to quit and help her. Or the third choice was to, I'm just gonna do this with her all the time. And obviously I chose the latter and for another, it, they don't call it speed for nothing because it speeds up your life. For another you know, 10 years, I was heavily engulfed and constantly doing it. I couldn't go to work without being on it. I couldn't be productive. I was wrecked. I was just in my house sleeping heavily um, on the days that I slept. And then sometimes I would just get back up. And once I could get more, I would go and go and go and go. And you know, there's days where I was up for anywhere from seven to nine days. It's not humanly possible, obviously, for somebody to stay up that long, but, um, but I would make it that way. There, obviously there was a lot of times when I would doze off, I'd be driving on the freeway. There was times when I would go into autopilot mode and seriously be driving behind the wheel. I shouldn't, been, I shouldn't have been on the road. Be driving behind the wheel and seeing a full on dream and just in a la la land, right? And then I would wake up and think, oh my God, I just missed my freeway exit. So those were the effects. Now, what ended up happening was down the line, um, it, brought me to my knees. Methamphetamines was my demise. I did a lot of drugs, but when I did methamphetamines, it brought me to my knees and it made me com you know, completely desperate. I remember I was in a fetal position, homeless, in my car, just dying. Just thinking, like, how am I gonna like, get off of this stuff? Now, I, I was uh, 
Nobody really wanted to have anything to do with me anymore. My family had written me off like a bad check. And I remember that it had, what it resorted to was I was driving on the freeway. I just picked up a bag of dough and meth and I had put it underneath my car with one of those car magnet things. And I'm driving on the 55 freeway to go from one, from the dealer's house to somebody else's house, to this girl's house who had thrown in some money on it. And I, I guess the magnet was weak and it had fallen out, off from underneath my car. And I remember just going to her house. She didn't believe me. She thought I stole the meth, which that's what happens to. You don't trust anybody. You don't trust your friends. You don't trust anyone. You don't trust yourself. And that's what it had come down to. I told her, no, I swear it fell out. I was looking underneath the car, just like losing my mind. And I went back to the freeway and I'm scouring up and down the freeway, walking up and down the side of the freeway, looking for this box with the magnet in it. And, um, and eventually I didn't find it. I just, I, I was hoping like some other drug addict would find it at least. That's like the mentality I had. But I remember thinking in one moment, um, is this what my life has come to? Seriously, like I'm spending the last money to my name for my paycheck to go and buy drugs that are, pro and believe me, back then they would even cut the meth with other stuff like chicken feed and things like that, which they called myrrh. But uh, it looked like meth, but it didn't do anything to you. But anyway, so I went and I'm scouring the freeways looking for it. And once I got back to my car and didn't find it, I just went back to the dealer's house and spent the last bit of my money and bought more. And that was like the onset to me actually wanting to get sober. I didn't get sober right away. I still chased you know, the high for, for a few more weeks. But uh, I remember that finally, when I put up the white flag and I called for help, um, my mom wasn't helping me anymore, but she referred me to somebody else who referred me to a treatment center, but I needed to go and dry out. So because I'd been doing meth and a few other drugs, I went to a friend's house. I, uh, the withdrawals of meth are nothing like opiates. When it comes to doing a lot of meth, your withdrawals are, you're basically gonna be needing to sleep a lot. And you have a lot of body aches and you need to just rest. So, you know, it's not like a, a crazy gnarly detox, but it definitely is emotionally draining, spiritually draining, physically, you know, your body is just like not all there. And, um, and mentally, like mentally, you know, your body needs to, re your mind needs to rejuvenate. And so um, when I went into a friend's house and dried out for a while, finally, I remember going into treatment about nine days after that. I was drinking and smoking weed during that time. But um, after I realized I can't do it on my own, I remember going to treatment. And here's, the, here's, the, here's what's amazing about the, how much I was captivated by it. my meth usage was that even in treatment in my first two weeks, because I spent a lot of time in bathrooms doing meth before, whether I was smoking it or snorting it or whatever, I would go and go through this movement where I would sit in the bathroom in the treatment center, take out my lighter and pretend like I was hitting the pipe because I was so used to doing that. It had become such a ritual, ritualistic type of experience for me that I remember just thinking one day within a couple of days of doing this practice over and over again, Pej, what are you doing? Like you're, you're so out of your mind that you, you, you still feel like you're going through the motions of doing this meth. There's nothing there. There's no pipe in your hand. And I, and I put down the, the lighter and I thought, dude, you need to stop. Like you're in treatment now, you need to conform to whatever they're doing in this house and you need to stop doing this. And so um, at about four months of sobriety, I had a, uh, a um, it was a storage unit that they wanted me to go and empty out with all my stuff in it. And I remember when I went there, I found a meth pipe and at this point I had taken my sobriety so serious that when I found the meth pipe and it was caked with all this dried up meth inside of it, I just took it, looked at it, I broke out in a sweat and went and broke it in, I went and took it to a dumpster, shattered it and threw it away. And um, at about six months, of, six months of sobriety, it was Thanksgiving, I'd called one of my old tweaker friends, I got brave, he said that he was hungry, he wanted some Thanksgiving food, so I took some food over to his house, went inside of his house, I gave him, he hadn't eaten in like two weeks, so I gave him the food, and I said, who's in the garage? He said, a couple of our old friends. I went in the garage. The second I walked in, I watched these guys hitting the pipe. The very thing that I was doing all the time around the clock for so long, there's my drug of choice. It's right in front of me. I see these guys are doing it. And I remember just thinking in that moment, in that instance, I have no reason, no, no reason to be in this place. And my mom's face uh, kind of just ran through my mind, my sponsor, all these different people uh, from recovery. And I, and I, but again, sweat was trickling down my face and I just walked out of there and never went back there again. And, you know, I've been successfully sober for over 11 years, 11 years and about three months and some change. So um, if I can, 
you know, encourage anybody out there, if you're stuck on meth, it's not physically addicting, it is mentally addicting. So if you keep finding yourself doing it over and over again, you can break that cycle depending on if you wanna make that absolute decision. I remember I used to hit the pipe, sit in the mirror, stare at myself, blow smoke into my own face, staring at myself in the mirror and think, I'm not so bad. And the, the problem is, is that if you're using meth, even here and there, there's really no one that really uses meth uh, recreationally, occasionally. If you're doing it, you're doing it. You know you are. You know, you're not, you're always chasing it. If you're caught up and doing meth, you're always doing it. But that's not, what I remember always thinking when I was stuck on the pipe was that it wasn't supposed to be like this. It wasn't supposed to, why have I gotten so deep into this? And when they call it the devil's dandruff, truly it turns you into a demon. I looked at my best friend growing up and he got into it right before me. And I remember just looking into his eyes and they were sunken and, and it looked like I was looking into the eyes of Satan. And then I had started to become like that. It made me violent, it made me angry. I had tons and tons and tons of car wrecks. I crashed into a cop that lived on my street, into his personal car, I totaled his car because I was up for so many days that I was working in Seal Beach and I drove all the way down the 405 and got to Crown Valley. And I remember just thinking, I just gotta get the car to my street so I can go and get into my bed. I just need to land the ship. And I remember when I got to my street, I thought, oh, I'm home free, I'm gonna get, as I kept going, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I passed out behind the wheel, crashed right into his car and totaled his car. And, and that's you know what was happening. I was crashing into parked cars. There was oftentimes that I'd be on the freeway, clenching the steering wheel, just screaming at the top of my lung, I hate this. I hate this feeling. I want this to go away. Why can't I stop? Why can't I stop? That's how bad I had gotten on meth. So when I say it's the devil's dandruff, I don't say it loosely. It truly is. It will take a toll on you. It will, it will minimize your lifespan. I remember feeling like my heart was gonna blow out of my chest sometimes. Like I would get these palpitating murmurs. Like I just felt like, like I'm gonna have a heart attack. I truly, if I would've kept doing meth, smoking it, especially the stuff that was that was going around back then, like the ice that we were moving out to Hawaii. If I continued doing that stuff, I promise you I wouldn't be sitting here today. I'm so glad I made that absolute decision. I hope you do too. I hope you found this relatable and helpful. We're gonna be doing a lot more videos like this. Um, you can subscribe to, to all of our videos. We'll be talking about various drugs and uh, we'll go from there.